All right. So we just have a few more topics to wrap up chapter three. Um, and we're going to start with thinking about polynomial regression. So I talked to you already about interaction terms. So that would be where you have the interaction between say x1 and x2, and then you get a beta coefficient on that interaction. But uh, we don't have to specifically think about interaction between two different variables. We could think about the interaction of a variable with itself. So we could think about the relationship between x1 and x1, the interaction there, and that would be like including x1 squared in our model. Um, and then we could have a beta on, on that interaction with itself. Um, so using polynomial regression like this is a good technique if you have some curvature in your data. I think we've already hinted to this when we were talking about transformations of variables. We were transforming variables by doing square or square root or log transformations. So this is essentially the same thing. Um, there's such a thing as a complete second order model, which is if you have two predictors, so you've got an x1 and an x2, and you're going to do a complete second order model, it needs to have all the combination of terms. So it's going to have a beta zero, just an intercept. Then it'll have the individual uh, betas on just x1 and x2. It will have both the squared terms. And then it will have a term where you multiply x1 and x2 and have the interaction between those two variables. And you can extend, you could have the complete third order model, uh, which would have even more terms in it. It would have, you know, like x squared times x or x1 squared times x2, x2 squared times x1, um, etc. Um, I don't put a ton of emphasis on polynomial regression because I don't think that it's usually that useful. Um, typically, just having variables by themselves is enough, um, but there's a couple examples in the book uh, which I'd like you to read and look at, um, and I think there's one homework problem that's related to this. So uh, it's just uh, basically an extension of interaction terms. What I do want to spend some time on is thinking about the problem of correlated predictors. So if you have correlated predictors, it makes your model very brittle. We're imagining uh, that our data is a sample from some larger population. And uh, if we were to take another sample from that same population and try and fit the model again, that model would be potentially very different um, if we have correlated predictors. So uh, you can't uh, trust the directionality of the coefficients. And you can't trust p-values. So those are obviously things that we care a lot about. Um, we're usually at least thinking about, you know, is this uh, coefficient positive or negative? Is it a positive relationship with the response variable or is it a negative response? Um, and we also really care about p-values. So the fact that we have these kind of untrustworthy models when we have correlated predictors means that we want to try to avoid that at all costs. So we talk about um, correlation between predictors, or sometimes we'll use the term multicollinearity. And I find that students often get confused at this point in the semester between multicollinearity and a lack of independence. So I'd like to talk about both of those. So if we have a rectangular data set, and hopefully it's tidy, so the rows are observations, and the columns are variables. Uh, maybe I'll make two copies of this so that we can talk about it twice. If we have multicollinearity or correlated predictors, that means there's a relationship between the columns. It means that this column might be correlated with this column. So that means that I shouldn't use both x1 and x2 in my model because they might be correlated with one another. Um, lack of independence 
So that's the L-I-N-E conditions. We're thinking about the I there. Uh, the lack of independence is about a relationship between the rows. So it's that uh, a particular observation might not be uh, independent from another observation. So these are, are two different problems. Either way, uh, we should do something to fix it or we shouldn't model uh, using that data set, um, but they, they're separate problems. So I think we've talked a lot about independence and lack of independence already, and now we're really focusing on multicollinearity, uh, which is related to correlated predictors. So if we're worried about multicollinearity uh, or correlated predictors, one of the ways that we can check for that is by using the VIF, which is the variance inflation factor. And this is basically saying like, how much is your variance inflated based on having these uh, correlated predictors? So uh, the way that we calculate the variance inflation factor, it's for a particular variable, like an xi. Um, and so we could have the vif for that uh, x sub i. And the way that we're going to compute it is 1 over 1 minus this r squared, where that r squared is the r squared value of the model trying to predict that x sub i using all the other predictors from your model. So let's imagine that we had y tilde uh, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4. If we were going to try and find the VIFs for each of these x's, we could have VIF1, which would be 1 over 1 minus the r squared 1, which would be the r squared from trying to predict x1 by x2 plus x3 plus x4. And then we would have VIF2, 1 over 1 minus r2 squared, and that r squared would be from predicting x2 by x1 plus x3 plus x4, etc. And our rule of thumb is we want our variance inflation factor value to be less than 5, if it's greater than or equal to five, that's a concern for multicollinearity and we should do something. Probably we should remove at least one of our variables. So I'll just give you a little bit of an example. Um, this is related to my GSS data set where uh, I've been trying to predict the highest year of school someone completed. And it probably makes sense that the fathers level of education and the mother's level of education would be correlated with one another. So if we were thinking about our data set in this kind of rectangular format, we've got mother's level of education, we've got father's level of education, and we might think that those two variables could be correlated with one another, that, uh, that mother's education is already related to father's education. So it could be a bad thing to include both of those predictors in our model because uh, they might make our coefficients have the wrong directionality or they might have our p-values um, looking significant or not significant um, in incorrectly. So, so here's a model where I'm trying to predict the highest year of school completed based on the amount of father's education, mother's education, and age. And uh, it looks pretty good. Um, I've got significant p-values on all of my coefficients. I've got a significant p-value on my overall model. I'm only explaining 22% of the variability in highest year of school completed, but it's looking overall pretty good. Um, and we could do our normal kinds of assess things like looking at the plots. I'm going to skip that for right now. But another way to assess our model uh, before we proceed with it is to look at the variance inflation factor. So I've done this two different ways here. One is uh, I did it sort of the hard way. And in that case, I fit each of the different little models. So I tried to predict uh, the mother's schooling based on the father's schooling and the age. I tried to predict the father's schooling based on the mother's schooling and the age. And I tried to predict age based on the mother's schooling and the father's schooling. 
So those are the models um, which are trying to predict one of the predictors by all the other predictors. And then I'm just doing a little bit of base R code. I'm pulling out the R squared value from each of the summaries from these, uh, these little models. And I'm doing one over one minus that R squared value. So this is my variance inflation factor variance inflation factor for mother, uh, my variance inflation factor for father, and my variance inflation factor for age. Um, and I was actually kind of surprised when I did this um, that there, there definitely is some relationship between a mother's level of education and father's level of education, but these values are actually way below that cutoff of uh, five. So it might actually be fine to include both mother's education and father's education. Um, the variance inflation factor on age is noticeably smaller than the one on uh, mother and father, and that makes sense. We wouldn't think that your uh, your mother's education would be super correlated with your age or your father's with your age, um, but but there's like something going on there a little bit. So I just did it uh, this sort of hard way to illustrate to you what was going on, but the easier way to find the VIF value in R um, is to use the VIF function. It comes from the package car for classification and regression, and we're doing regression. Uh, and you would just run VIF on a model that had all of those things in it. So I don't think I showed you that model um, but it was the one from, from this previous slide where I'm predicting the highest year of school completed based on father, mother, and age. Um, and so I just run VIF on M1, and it gives me the VIF for father, the one for mother, and then the one for age. And they're the same numbers that we found doing it the hard way. So I recommend just doing it the easy way. So this is another thing to add to your toolbox when you're assessing your model is finding the VIF. And then my last little piece of lecture content before we switch over to the kind of lab in our studio is this idea of testing subsets of predictors. So, so far we've looked at p-values on individual terms in a model. We've also looked at a p-value at an overall model. But if we want to compare two models, the tool that we've been using is the adjusted R-squared. And we're going to have another way to compare two models to one another, um, and it's called a nested f-test. And uh, this uses the ANOVA function in R, you'll see it in the lab, um, which is kind of like overusing the word ANOVA, the R function ANOVA, but we can run ANOVA on um, several models at once. And it's gonna give us a test statistic, which is an F value again. And that F value is computed with this formula. We find the sum of squares for the model, the full model, and then we subtract off the sum of squares from the model, from the reduced model, divided by the difference in the number of predictors between the full and the reduced models. And then we divide that whole thing by the sum of squares of the errors from the full model, divided by n minus k minus 1. And this will tell us if our full model is actually better than the smaller model or not. So I think this is all easier to see when you're doing it in R, so I'm going to switch over to RStudio for the next video.